Hello, I'm Femi OK. Welcome to the Streams Online Pre-Show. This is where you get a behind-the-scenes look at our preparation for the main show. And today we have a special guest, Malaysian Member of Parliament, Nurul Idal Anwar. And many are predicting that she could be the country's first female Prime Minister. We're going to talk about her career, family and plans for Malaysia. Thank goodness we have 40 minutes. Hello, Iza. Hello. Welcome to the stream. Thank you for having me. You sound a little... How would you describe the tone of your voice right now? Apprehensive? Mm -hmm. Ah, 40 minutes and that's what you get. <laughs> I think you're interesting enough to keep us going for 40 yes, minutes. I, I, I hope so. Yeah. Otherwise, you can make some stuff up. Oh, Malika no, Bilal. that's not advisable <laughs> for politicians in yes, Malaysia. Yes, absolutely. There enough politicians doing that. So. <laughs> Malika Bilal. Thank you, Femi. You're welcome. What are you I'm up to today? I'm ready. People yeah, are tweeting. On. It is, uh, as someone just put it in uh -huh. a tweet, an ungodly hour. <laughs> um, but Malaysians are tweeting. They'll be watching the show. And I'll be looking for all of your live feedback, whether it's thank on Twitter, you, <laughs> Facebook. Yes, yeah. thank you. <laughs> from On behalf of the stream as well, thank you for joining our conversation. And so part of our conversation is going to be in our Google Hangout. Let me introduce our Google Hangout to you. We have Julian Tan. He's a Malaysian student at Cambridge University in the United Kingdom. Nikki Chong. Hey Hello there. Nikki Chung is a digital consultant in Kuala Lumpur. Kavalan Nakaswama is a blogger in Klang, Malaysia. And Fadaus Hosni is a lawyer in Kuala Lumpur. Hello there, Google Hangout. You're looking alive and well and lively at this time in the morning. So let me ask Isa first of all, when you prep for an interview, yes. do you just turn up or what prep would you do? Depends on how much time I have. Mm -hmm. So for this interview, I didn't have time to prep. But I am confident my Malaysian friends will be, do, will be doing the smart questioning. So. Okay, so Julian, what are you looking forward yes. to most out of this conversation? Hello Julian, do you remember me? Sorry. Hey, I, well, I remember you. you I remember, remember you me? and we met on the airplane. Oh, great. Oh, sorry. oh fantastic. Julian? Um, yeah. What I'll be looking forward most, I guess, is to sort of like um, address issues that are very important in Malaysia, but um, no, don't necessarily have international um, knowledge it's not international knowledge at this point so it's great that uh, al jazeera is putting you know real issues in malaysia to the forefront of uh, international news great nikki what are you looking forward to most well i'm actually looking forward to listening to this conversation hi Yuza. <laughs> hello um it's been a while Thanks uh, but no it's up. great I, yeah no, i know i stayed up so <laughs> Uh, but it's great, I think, to have like you know four Malaysians um, having this conversation and stuff. I think this is a great concept, um, and I'm enjoying. Just, I'm, I'm looking forward to see what kind of conversations we have. Thank you, Kavalan. Woke up about 50 minutes ago. Kavalan, how are you doing? He's very famous. He's very famous. Uh, oh, he is. <laughs> okay. Hi, Isa. Hi. Um, okay, so I'm just I'm just here to listen to uh, Isa for uh, on her opinions and uh, what they should think about the current situations in Malaysia. Uh, situations that are having pressing needs to be, uh, to be focused on, to be, to be concerned on. Okay. All right. A man with an agenda for Dallas. What are you looking forward to most in the next now 35 minutes? Hi, Nurul Iza. Hi. Hi, hi. Uh, not too long ago, you attended the... Yes, uh, the Bar Council program. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and thank you for coming. Thank, thank you very you for much for me. that. Uh, and uh, well, uh, I, I am looking forward to uh, hear uh, what are the uh, uh, status of the reforms that which which you announced that that you say you wanted to push in terms of uh, elections, uh, political and also uh, parliamentary reforms. I want to know how far, you know, how feasible it, how feasible is it, and how far would that would that would these reforms go uh, in the parliament? Yeah. Okay, I am really looking forward to this conversation. I feel that between you and our Google Hangout and Malik and the community, we're going to get a great insight into what's happening today in Malaysian politics and your role in that as well. Are you ready? Yes. <laughs> you said yes. Like yeah, uh, I, I tried no. to focus on certain alphabets. All yeah. right. <laughs> Do you know what? I think we are ready. We are going to start with the main show. It's going to be a conversation with Nural Iza Anwar. I think it's going to be a good one. So join us in the main show of the stream coming up in 30 seconds time. See you there.
Hello, I'm Femi O.K. and you're in the stream. Today, will she be the first female Prime Minister of Malaysia? Parliament member Nuru Iza Anwar joins us to discuss her future. In a country as ethnically and religiously diverse as Malaysia, Nuru Iza Anwar has championed inclusive politics and human rights for all, earning the nickname Princess of reform. Now only 32 years old, she's already won a seat in parliament twice, managing to emerge from her parents' shadow. Her father is Anwar Ibrahim, the country's former deputy prime minister, who was jailed on what he called politically inspired charges of sodomy and abuse of power. And her mother is currently president of the opposition's People's Justice Party. Analysts believe that Isa will become one of the main candidates to head the party when her mum steps down. And this has many predicting that she will eventually become the country's first female prime minister. Now, although there are accusations of nepotism and popularism, she has gained a very strong following among Malaysians' youth and marginalised communities as she campaigns to eliminate racial and religious divisions. So, joining us now in the studio is Nura Isa Anwar herself. Isa, welcome to the stream. Thank you. What's it like listening to a mini biography like that? I try to keep a straight face. Okay. Yes. We're going to hear more from you in just a moment. Now, uh, Isa will be taking your questions in just a minute. But we can't begin the program without first introducing our digital producer, Malika Valal. Malika. Thank you. Thank you very much, Femi. Now, we also have a few members of our community in our Google Plus Hangout. With us today is Julian Tan, who's a Malaysian student at Cambridge University in the UK. In Kuala oh Lumpur gosh. is Nikki Chiang, a digital consultant. Blogger Kavila Nakaswaram joins us from Klang, Malaysia. In Ferdows Hosni is a lawyer in Kuala Lumpur. Welcome to all of you. For those of you who aren't in the Hangout, remember you can tweet in using hashtag AJStream. So there are so many ways and so many titles that we can use to introduce Issa. My favorite one is on my computer though, on her Twitter profile. It says, I am the proud mother of two cuties. Hello, proud mother of two cuties. How are the cuties doing? Uh, good. I'm sure they're missing me. I miss them too. So, How is the youngest and how is the eldest? Uh, Safiya is a six. Harith is four. So when you were six, do you remember what you wanted to do? I want to be a policeman. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> God knows what it means in Malaysia right now, but yeah. <laughs> when did that change? When did you say, no, I, I won't be a policeman. I'll, I'll be, I don't know, a very young politician. Um, well, but the politics came about after my father's sacking and eventual arrest, which happened exactly 15 years ago. Right. So, you know, I'm really a child due to circumstance. And I think um, it's made my life very meaningful. And I hope to many people who experience reformacy, that's what it means the most, to participate in the country's future. Give us a little insight into your family life growing up as a, as a youngster because you had five other siblings, two parents who were politicians. Did yeah. you just have to look after yourself, for instance? Um, <laughs> well, to be fair, my mum was an ophthalmologist okay. um, and she served the government hospital for 14 years. She, um, she was really the, the pillar of strength of, for the family. But we grew up very much um, you know, looking at our father as a hero, heroic figure. Um, but it was, you know, we lived a relatively simple life. Um, you know, away from the camera, away from the public glare, so to say. And I went to government school all my life. Um, and of course, a public university in Malaysia before pursuing my master's overseas. I, okay. I love looking at, at pictures and images of you campaigning. I know we've got some, so we're, oh, we'll show our audience I hope some I'm of not those. That, that much <laughs> in the, in the photo. And you're very, when I look at you, you're very yeah. charming, you're very determined when you're campaigning. There's, there's lots of pictures of you doing exactly this, which is mixing with people, chatting to people, uh -huh. connecting. Where does that come from? Well, I think, you know, I, 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 the prerequisite is really sincerity. I never forget that in 98 and the years preceding it, we really enjoyed so much public support, public sympathy for what happened to, to our father. So when I contested, it was really much an, a way of me thanking uh, the people who were with us all the while. And you know, we, when you're sincere, I, you know, you have to be happy with, with doing whatever you do. You know, politics is so, in, you know, it's like a, a contract that's never renewed. It depends whether people vote for you every five years. So, you, know, you have to enjoy it and you have to have meaning in, in whatever you're pursuing. For as m many as the campaign videos I've seen and you sort of being out and about being a politician, there's one video, one video, 
it's so great. I really want okay. to share it with the audience. Really? Your f yes, okay. your face. You, you just <laughs> we see your face now. See your face in a moment. Have a look at this audience. They scare me with you. Without you, but I I stopped singing ever. I, uh, since that day, I realised that my first um, responsibility is to be a politician. Not so that was a fundraising no, event? Yes, it was a fundraising event. I don't think it got much money due to my singing, but... <laughs> I'm going to kill Al Jazeera, but never mind. Malika, help mm. Isa get out of this embarrassing little moment. <laughs> yes. Move us on a bit. Our community is going to help you out. Now, when they heard yeah. that you were going to be on the show, the uh -huh. questions came flooding in. So a couple of them are on your age. Safe Malik tweets in, if you're younger, you'll be at a disadvantage in every country. And as you maybe uh, might be seen as being less experienced and mature. But on the other hand, Saruki says age was an advantage in your case. But it wasn't the driving factor. It was your clean image and idealism, this person says. So has age ever been a difficulty um, and trying to do what you want to do in Malaysia? Well, I think I if you look at the year 2008, we had a 12 general elections in Malaysia and a lot of young uh, candidates actually contested uh, basically because, you know, we wanted new politics and uh, we felt that, you know, we should step up to the mantle and offer ourselves to service the people. And they say, well, we might be inexperienced, but because we lack experience in corrupt practice, we lack experience in uh, collusion, I mean, in, in abuse of power. So, yeah, I, I think I'm also thankful with the fact that Malaysians themselves have warmed up to the idea of the young taking up the mantle. It's very much not just a pull factor, it was also the push. When we go back to 1998, this is when your, your father faced charges, and this was a really tough time for your family because in a Muslim country like Malaysia, the charges were pretty horrific for the general mm -hmm. public to actually even take on board. So we're looking at sodomy and graft as well. People ask you about this all the time, myself included. How do you manage having to talk about that? I don't think there will ever be a time when you won't have to at least reference it. I think the close bond we have as a family and the fact that we are not fighting for him as a person. We, we fought for the principles he represented. That's most important because from the very beginning, it would go. It was to fight for not just Anwar Ibrahim's release, but the release of all political prisoners. And it was declared one by Amnesty International. So I think, you know, do not personalize any anything. I mean, there were sad moments. I, I, might, I will not deny that. The second sodomy charge was especially fa painful for my mom and, and the rest of us. Uh, but we have to really um, look forward and understand that there's a bigger movement here. The struggle is important and you have to keep up at it. So, yeah. Well, I want to go straight to our hangout now and, and let's hear from Nikki, who's actually a member of your constituency. I know. <laughs> lives outside of Kuala Lumpur. Go ahead, Nikki. Hi, Isa. Um, I was actually just wondering, I mean, just because I come from your constituency and stuff, that um, I guess my interest in your politics is really from a local level as well as a national level, considering that you're such a, you're a national leader. Um, Considering what happened in last elections and that your dad, um, as the opposition leader, is aging, I'm just wondering um, what kind of plans you have or how do you see yourself moving up um, as a young generation taking over? Because, um, you know, he'll be quite old the next election, whether he'll be running or not. Mm -hmm. um, thanks, Nikki. I, you know, I think what's most important is uh, for Pakatan Rakyat, which is the coalition uh, representing the opposition, is to have like-minded, progressive young leaders. Uh, because it, it has to be um, a team of collective leadership. You know, you can't, de you can't depend on one particular individual to hold it together. But I think for all intents and purposes, uh, the opposition leader is still Anwar Ibrahim. And we, the second generation level, are working very closely to ensure that these ideals are propagated. Um, the Secretariat yeah, uh, of Pakatan Rakyat is working hard to produce our own alternative budget come 2014. So I think, you know, um, there are concerns, but I believe it's not so much the age, but to ensure that this team of younger leaders as well as older leaders are convinced uh, that, you know, to be progressive, to be fair and just, and also e to provide equal opportunities for all Malaysians is the way to move forward. 
uh, if you're asking specifically on the party elections, I think Al Jazeera will do an expose on me. Uh, just wait. Is a, there's something I really want our audience to understand about the breakdown in Malaysia as far as the ethnic breakdown is mm -hmm. concerned because it's pretty important. So here on my laptop, I've got that breakdown so that people yes. around the rest of the world can understand it and then you can maybe sure. explain it a little bit. So just over 67% of the population could be described as Malay. Then we have just Malay Bumiputra. Exactly. Mm -hmm. you, that's the word I was looking for. Thank <laughs> you so much. And then we've got just over 24% Chinese mm -hmm. and then uh, just over 7% Indian. And there's like a tiny little sliver here, which is 0.7% others. <laughs> so how does that impact the way you do politics in Malaysia, that breakdown of the ethnic groups? Well, I would say, um, you know, we came about in 1999 as a multiracial party. <coughs> my party, the People's Justice Party. And it was a challenge because we're dealing in an environment where the ruling government is made up of racially based uh, entities. So, you know, you're going to elections and you're advocating multiracial politics in a setting where everyone assumes it's already going to be racially polarized. But I think we made so much gains. Um, I have Chinese colleagues, you know, who frequent the mosques, uh, during Ramadan, uh, you know, uh, attending programs similarly when I'm invited to attend temples. Uh, and it's not just for show, it's not at a superficial level, but it is to represent as a person, as a candidate, you are supposed to defend the rights of all Malaysians. But <coughs> 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 Sorry. Malika. I'm coughing. Well, that's right, that's you can cough. Take, 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 take a glass of, take a sip of water. Because yeah. you drink first, for goodness sake. You've been saying oh. things uh, that, that are, of course, are making you uh, cough. But earlier what you said was equal opportunity for yes. all Malaysians, and that's what you're working for. So we're yes. getting tweets online. This one from Arif who says, what are your opinions on race-based affirmative action? Before you answer that, though, I know we have a member of our hangout, Kavilan, who wants to elaborate on that issue. Go ahead. Okay, hi. Um, Post-election, it seems like racial relations has either been worsening or given the illusion that it's worsening. Mm. A month or two ago, we witnessed some sort of uh, hypersensitivity among Muslim groups calling for stricter control of the environment to protect the sanctity of the religion. So, my question is, what is your, your view on the current racial and religious relations in Malaysia? If there are indeed tensions, why do you think so? And of course, how do you propose to approach this matter? The first, um, thanks, Kavilan. Uh, you know, it's such an important question. Sometimes it, it gets uh, us politicians also quite tense. Um, you know, post elections, you expect things to be more conciliatory. Um, however, it's important to put in context. Uh, it's n you know, it is normal and certain racialist elements and groups exist and in any democracy. I mean, this is a reali the, the reality. However, the problem we have in Malaysia is the government of the day takes upon itself to support these racial elements and racial groups. And I think um, you know, it does not help matters because as a government, you have to provide um, the leadership, uh, the sense of uh, the and take efforts to unify all different groups. Um, my, my take is, you know, some of it is very heavily politicized. Uh, it doesn't help that we are continuing to enjoy an elegant silence from our prime minister. But I'm, I'm still optimistic. You know why? Because we went through elections after elections. And the fact of the matter is, every each one of us, we have a stake. And I believe that Malaysians um, understand that we work best together. Uh, so this diversity that people keep um, dangling about like a negative, uh, you know, kryptonite. I, I think it, a piece of kryptonite. It is really um, our main source of strength and defines of uh, defines us as who we are. So I mean, notwithstanding the problems, uh, I think we should keep at it. We should keep refocusing on the national agenda. The fact that poverty affects right. people, regardless of race, and so on and so forth. And so what I find I as an observer, yes, absolutely. Go ahead, and then I'm going to ask a question. Is that okay? Oh, that's yeah. perfect. Um, Follow up. I Isa, I was just wondering what you thought about how, in, you know, in Malaysia, religion and race are so closely tied in the mm. sense that if you are Malay, you are necessarily Muslim. So it becomes very easy for you to use religion as a tool in order to, um, in order to, you know, 
in, in a sense conquer and uh, you know divide and conquer so what are your thoughts on this um, you know uh, tying of religion and race in Malaysia whether it really is a problem for our country I mean the, the identity of the Malay race is certainly embedded in our federal constitution and I think partly why it was done and structured as such is that was the prevailing practice here yeah, at the time of the independence and that's fine I, I think you know you're trying to accord a certain race their sense of identity uh -huh. but we must also remember uh, that you know faith I think I've spoken about this gotten in trouble for this uh, but faith it's is really it's, it's what you believe um, you know no one can coerce or, or force you How have you got in to trouble for talking belief? about faith do give us the example <laughs> share it with the rest of the okay, world I'll try to share it with the rest of the world um, well I spoke at an interfaith dialogue at a church in Malaysia and I, I'm actually being hauled out by the police and I was declared as a person who was promoting apostasy and it it is very sad because you would expect in Malaysia a multiracial multi-religious society there should be some room for discourse uh, for for dissent, uh, you know, for an, and greater understanding amongst uh, the people of various faiths. So, I mean, I think the best thing to do is for leaders to be principled and to to provide leadership when it comes, especially when it comes to religion. I mean, I you know, I I come from a party that celebrates everyone, and we affirm that Islam is the federal, uh, the religion of the federal uh, of the federation the official religion of the Federation. But, but so there are parties in, in Malaysia that are formed literally on religious lines. So this is quite a difficult yes, tightrope yes. that you're walking. What you're saying, it sounds, for the rest of us, well, that sounds normal. But if you have a party yeah. that just has Muslims in it and a party that just perhaps has the Chinese section of uh, yeah. Malaysia in it, then, then that's a problem, isn't it, for you, for you as a progressive? Uh, I would say certainly you know it's different uh, outlook a different ideology from my party but they have a right to exist now the the point i will bring is no sane and right thinking government must advocate such um sort of uh, polarized or, or even um unique and and uh, exclusive in exclusive uh, grouping so you know, one of our component party, mem um, party members is PAS, the Islamic Party. And I'm quite proud when we came together um, on the basis of a common policy framework. I mean, you can have different ideologies, but when you govern, uh, it has to be guided by principles that you agree to right. as a coalition. Milika. Yeah, there's a tweet here um, saying exactly the question that you just asked, Femi. Uh, YHK says, today in Malaysia, it's mm. easy to be a Muslim, but it's not easy to have other religions, and that's discrimination. But I want to change gears uh, just a little bit here. I want to go to Firdaus, because we have tons of questions for you. <laughs> Firdaus, in our hangout, go ahead. Firdaus? Hello. Your hi. turn. Yes, hi, <coughs> Roiza. Hello. All right, uh, now uh, on civil society, um, I, I'm actually um, on the uh, talking uh, interested about the series of political election as well as parliamentary reforms mm -hmm. which you have announced mm -hmm. uh, that you say you wanted to push for. Mm -hmm. Now on this, uh, on these reforms, uh, proposed reforms, uh, some of these reforms are already issues which are being advocated by the Malaysian Bar as well as yes, uh, other yes. civil society groups mm. uh, for quite some time already without much success. So in your opinion, considering the uh, challenges that you're going to face within uh, either within uh, the party uh, from the ruling coalition as well as the uh, Malaysian public in general, how 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 different is it going to be this time in, in, you know, in the attempt of trying to push these issues forward? You know, Firdaz, you, you mentioned a very important question because parliamentary and political reform is really my my babies. I mean, <laughs> there you know, I I I really feel so strongly uh, for us, and most of of the input I get is from the Malaysian Bar and various other civil societies. Um, God knows, you know, politicians, how can we live without them? So, <laughs> I the the I would just touch on the issue of implementation of these ideals. Now, as a member of Parliament, it's really impossible to see your private member's bill um, to be debated uh, because it's always going to be the government's bill that will be um, prioritized. However, I think our biggest challenge right now, this moment, 
we started out well by revoking emergency laws, revoking the Internal Security Act. However, with the increased incidences of crime, the government and the Prime Minister is using this opportunity to re reintroduce those laws. And that's a problem because we're not looking at things objectively. We're not looking at the statistics to prove one case or the other. And that is why greater and more discourse must take place. And we hope that the Malaysian Bar will continue to support the agenda for reform, for greater democratization. Because if not, we're going to give, we're going to go back. We're going to retrogress. I mean, I, I, I was so happy when um, Najib uh, Tun Razak, the Prime Minister, um, revoked the emergency declaration. But now, they might just reintroduce other sets of laws that will give the police more power to abuse uh, and of course um, persecute Malaysians, right. which they've done in the past. So people, our online community are watching this interview, they're yeah. watching the program. I just want to give you an instant response from online okay. on, my, on my laptop here from Twitter. Wow, this is a real role model for my young kids. Oh, so sweet. Um. Malika, what do you have? Well, the, there's a, just giving a little taste of what people are saying. While well, everyone else is waiting for the next iPhone, Shakin on Twitter says, I'm here waiting for AJ Stream interview with you all. I'm just giving a taste of how early it is in Malaysia. But I want to go back to Julian Tan in our hangout because he has another question. Go ahead, Julian. Thanks, Malika. So, uh, Isa, so many Malaysians like myself um, have actually left the country uh, in pursuit for better education standards, mainly tertiary education, and that's mainly because a lot of a lot of us recognize the poor and dwindling education standards in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And also, I guess it's also not very, it's kind of putting off when you think about the, you know, racial quotas that Malaysian public universities have. Not that this is a main issue, but yeah. it, it certainly doesn't help matters. And obviously, this causes a lot of brain drain, outflow of currency mm -hmm. for us having to pay for education that, we, that our own country cannot provide. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering whether you can, you've seen uh, Malaysian public universities returning to where we were 30, 40 years ago, where we were, where we were in the top 50 of, of uh, yes. university rankings. Yes. And if we can move forward from this racial quota, not just in... Um, universities but also in other sectors in Malaysia as well I mean um, I completely agree with you I think just recently uh, Malaysian universities slid further down uh, in the rankings yeah. and it's it's such a frustrating effect because we've been highlighting this time and again and you know quotas um, the fact that meritocracy is not being practiced as it should uh, while we understand the need to assist yeah the assist maybe perhaps those who are real living in the rural areas but the problem is is the politicization of education. Um, who gets to choose the vice chancellors of Malaysian university? You know, in Saudi Arabia, the university uh, you know, hosts um, a, a Chinese as its, its vice chancellor. I mean, but Malaysia, uh, that's always taboo. And for me, when it comes to education, um, we should allow the best uh, to head the universities. Right. And it starts with those not just necessarily um, yes men to the government but really yes men to education okay there's a picture on Malaysia Esquire and it's a really striking picture mm -hmm. you, you look shocked every, every time I bring up she my laptop the worst. <laughs> oh my god what is this happening this is a really striking picture okay half, that's not so bad half you <sighs> half yes. your dad Yes. The, uh, do you know, reading the subtext I'm just going to ask you just a straight yes or no question read the subtext here it's basically saying you're going to inherit your dad's mantle yes or no, no. do you want to be prime uh, minister of Malaysia? Um, I will say this you know he's very much a part of who I am today but I you know we make the decisions that will stay with us till the end of our lives and and I think you know um, how, how can you sum up so many things from just one picture Femi come on 40 this minutes is why is <laughs> we have the post show <laughs> How's the first 30 minutes been going for you? Oh, it's so fun. You're really good. Both of you. Thank okay. you. Yeah, well, maybe it's just a dread. <laughs> More questions. I know you have to add AJ stream for Isa. Meanwhile, let me tell you about tomorrow's program. We're going to be talking about a completely different subject, child abductions. Perhaps the most feared are abductions by strangers, but in international cases, they're often carried out by a family member. We'll discuss the rise in international child abductions and how to solve these cross-border family disputes. At another a show for another day. Thanks for watching.
Hello again, this is the Streams Online Post Show. We're still speaking with Malaysian Member of Parliament, Nurul Iza Anwar. Our Google Plus Hangout is also still here. Julian Tan, Malaysian student Hi. at Cambridge University in the UK. Hello. Nikki Chong is a digital consultant Hello. in Kuala Lumpur. Hey, Nikki. Kavya Nakaswama is a blogger in Klang, Hello. Malaysia. Hello. And Ferdas Hazni is a lawyer in Kuala Lumpur. Hello, everybody. Um, how, Hello, are you enjoying, how are you enjoying it so far, Google Hangout? It's, it's so great. great. It's a great listening yeah. to it. Yeah. Good, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. There's more to come. Malika? Our online community seems to be enjoying it too. We have a question. I'm going to start off. This one's from Facebook. Michelle asks, she says rather, if you become Prime Minister, it will be a big move forward for the people of Malaysia. I wish her luck. I would ask, what would you change first as Prime Minister, law-wise? I want to state at the outset that what Malaysians deserve is a good Prime Minister. Um, and I think all of us have to work very hard to get that. Um, number two, um, I think what's pressing is isu really the issue of political reforms. Um, because we have to reform not just the economy, but to ensure that from all, uh, all, all sectors, whether it's education, depoliticizing it, and making sure that uh, meritocracy is being breathed in these sectors. Because we, you know, it's not as if we don't know what to do. I think uh, the blueprint is there. It's about having the political will to allow the talents uh, to flourish and do what they do best. Uh, can, can I, I, can I also add? That? Yes, go, go ahead, let me do one at a time. So who said, can yeah. I? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Yeah, go on. Um, okay, so <laughs> Sorry for that, I'll come back to you. <laughs> Julian, go ahead. Uh, Nurul, you, you advocate a lot for inclusive politics. I think that's one of the main things that our um, country really needs is inclusive politics. Because right now, although our country is very much in, in print a democracy, uh, mm -hmm. in essence, I don't really feel like our country is a true democracy. Because mm -hmm. in a democracy, you should have a choice and you shouldn't be penalized for choosing something that's obviously less popular. Yeah. And with our current government being one of the longest served um, governments in the entire world. This makes it very, very difficult, I guess. So, we are how long the more do you see? Right now. Oh yeah. Uh, <coughs> how long do you, you know, see us? How long would it take for us to really move from where we are right now to, you know, one that you would, you know, like to see? A lot of us would like to see an inclusive pol political um, en environment. No, Malika. I think Julian brought up a good point. Uh, you know, any leader in this particular country must. Uh, bring forward the issue of inclusiveness as, as the main agenda. Um, you talk about the future, I'm looking at 14th general elections uh, <laughs> already because we, uh, despite uh, having to fight in the elections, the opposition with one hand tied behind our back, managed to garner as much as 52% of popular support. So, you know, first and foremost, we must push so that the redelineation exercise that will take place at the end of this year uh, will be done fairly, uh, electoral reforms will take place, and I'm confident in the 14 GE you will see change take place. So here's a Julian, 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 let me just jump in first and then because oh, I know yeah. Fadaus really wanted to as well so we've got a whole line of people <laughs> jumping in but I'm going to jump in first, my boots are bigger. So Julian brought up right. a really important point here which is how can one party be a ruling party for 56 years. That's confusing for an outsider. You have to call yourself a democracy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's <laughs> bizarre. How is that even possible? Um, there's a brilliant study done uh, by UM Cidel, uh Institute housed in University of Malaya that showcased throughout election after election, the only way Barisan Nasional, which is a national front, the government of Malaysia won, is through gerrymandering. Meaning, they just change constituencies from time to time, and basically the boundaries. Sorry, so that's why I mentioned redelineation because right. at the end of this year, if that takes place, they'll win with a mega majority in the 14 GE. So gerrymandering, uh, according to UM Cidel, and I think it's important to understand the powers of incumbency. You must. I, I think that you also. I, sorry, can I just go ahead? Go ahead. I mean, just, I just think that in the context of that, <laughs> I don't disagree with you, uh, Vida. Yes, yes. But I think there's also a historical issue in that um, until about eight years, um, two elections ago, we didn't have a united front in terms of opposition. So it was much harder um, to, you know, for the opposition to win as well. So I think we need to acknowledge that. So uh, only adding on, adding on meaning, to Nikki's yes. point, uh, I think right up to eight years ago, we did not have a uh, 
proper social social media <laughs> or internet presence for mm. information dissemination. Mm. All so information how, yeah. was kept within the government means, and there was no alternative source of information. I think that helped as well. For Dows, you are a patient woman. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I salute your patience. Everybody <laughs> else, <laughs> so let me give for Dows some space. <laughs> Still on the issue of uh, of reforms, you mentioned you said that you know as if as if this moment uh, political reforms is, is very important. Now on on those reforms uh, which you have announced, uh, some of these reforms require an amendment to the constitution. So I was just wondering, considering the um, number of uh, seat representation of both sides from uh, in the parliament, and and considering that you would need generally at least two thirds majority mm. in the parliament, how do you foresee uh, uh, parties from both sides? Sitting down together, working towards a common aim, uh, towards these reforms. Uh, yeah, uh, how 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 optimistic are you towards changing these reforms? Well, you know, um, thank you, Fridas. I just that's a good question. Uh, the opposition has come together for at least uh, since 1999 um, as a coalition, and I think it's uh, it's very important to take stock of the offer made by the opposition leader uh, in recent times to say that we should start at least with by sitting down on the same table <laughs> uh, both yes, uh, the, right. the BN and Pakatan at least to address crime to address uh, other problems facing the nation and I think it's a good step I I was happy because the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement um, actually brought the opposition and the government together so I managed to meet the Trade Minister twice um, on this particular issue, which has never happened before in Malaysia's uh, history, well, at least when it, to, it comes to the opposition. So you, you're right, uh, we're, we're doing our best, and I, we hope that at the end of the day, this country, Malaysia, cannot be dictated uh, based on what happens during AMNO, uh, the, the main party in, in the, the government's uh, elections. Because, I mean, we can't be held ransom while all the AMNO politicians uh, you know, compete with each other trying to showcase who's more right-wing uh, than the other. So we are offering um, our services and our thoughts and our friendship to the Prime Minister and we hope that he has the political will to do what is necessary for the benefit of Malaysia. And speaking of political will, you know, some of our online community members are asking, do you have what it takes to vote against party lines if need be? Uh, um, well. I think this was put to the test uh, when we had several bills uh, introduced in the Malaysian Parliament and I guess the best judge of it is when it actually happens. Uh, I would like to think, uh, you know, th there's always a balance that you have to strike. One is to follow your conscience and really vote based on that, but the second is also to ensure there's relatively good degree of party discipline uh, to present um, a united front. So whatever it is, I hope the two always meet. Um, I want to make sure the party I love, the party I come from, always vote uh, for, for the right things and, and on the right, uh, for the right things, yeah. You've been sitting there chatting to us for 40 minutes. I have? Yes. <gasps> Did you want to ask the Google Hangout any questions? <laughs> Okay. You should turn the tables a little bit. I see. I'll give I you see. one question. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm glad. Yeah. Okay. Uh -oh. so <laughs> Be afraid, Google Hangout. <laughs> okay. Um, so, first is to Julian. Yeah. So, we last met on the plane. And you did. you did so great and you made me feel very proud to be a Malaysian uh, because you, you were exceedingly spectacular as as the you know the performer in Oxford, so how is Come it? On, how is life uh, yeah. treating you at a Cambridge? Because I know the two have very different cultures. He's been to Oxford oh. and Cambridge. I told you, oh. he's a brilliant Malaysian. <laughs> His head won't fit I in the Google Hangout. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> <laughs> how big it is? <laughs> that brain is huge. Let him let him speak. Um, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, host. Sorry, the new host of the stream. <laughs> okay. Right. I've been sure. instructed to let you speak, Julian. <laughs> I'm in trouble. I'm going to be kicked out in like five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Julian. Sorry. Um, how does Oxford compare to Cambridge? Is that the question? Yes. Um, I don't think I can get. I can give a very fair comparison because I did an undergrad in Oxford, and obviously a postgraduate course in Cambridge right now. Mm -hmm. But I will say this: I do prefer postgraduate life to undergraduate life because undergraduate life was very intense. Yeah. But as as a city, both both institutions they are fabulous institutions and. 
you know, if you if you're really serious about what you want to study, I think they're two very good institutions to consider for your further studies. And I do recommend that you look up Julian's blog because he does a little blog about how to get into Oxbridge, which is too late for me, but for the rest of you young people out there, have a go at that. You're stalking me, Femi. You have another question? Do you know if you ever give up politics, you should just come hang out here. Yes, you have one more question. Okay, can I? Yes, go ahead. So, Nikki, I want to ask you, how was the run for the Relay for Life this year? I was hospitalized, so I missed it. Ah, it's a shame. It went really well. It was much smaller scale than um, for breast cancer society. awareness. So thank you, thank you for the backstory, <laughs> future host. We need a little bit of a backstory. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Nikki. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I th it went well as usual. They got it gets lots of support. I think there's yeah. a bit of um, I suspect there's a bit of a media fatigue because it's been so many years. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So there were this, it was a much smaller scale than usual. But um, it's always great to um, see so many people come together. Um, you know, as you know that um, cancer is a big cause of. Um, a, a cause that I support very well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, uh, can I just say, um, um, Femi, that um, Isa, a few years ago when I kind of organized a fundraising thing, that um, she made time to come out and actually give us a donation. So I'm very appreciative of that. Oh. You may just say that. So we are <laughs> wrapping up now, Isa, if, if that's okay with you. That is okay. Is that Thank okay with you, you Google Hangouts? Yeah. Yes. We're going to wrap yes. it up. Malika, what do you have for us? Well, see you guys in Malaysia. <laughs> Speaking so, yeah. of a woman of the people, uh, clearly knows most of the members of our Hangout had something glowing to say about all of them. But there's a question for you. First, some glowing words on Twitter. Anne says, women leaders for the win. You will become the first female prime minister. No doubt you have the charisma. But Olua Toby says, if you eventually assume office as the first female PM, what would you want to be remembered for? We'll make that your closing thought. That I love um, doing what I do, and that I'm only here because people trust me. Is I have an alternative reason for you to be remembered for, and it's here oh on, my God. on Vimeo. I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> See you after this outside. It's a good way to die. <laughs> I'm gonna kill. She is a mom of two cuties. Oh, someone kill me now. She's an MP. Guys, switch off. Go. She comes from a, a very know, important now. family in Malaysia. <laughs> it's, a, it's been a great pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining yeah, I us. I still want to kill you though, but okay. I, I'm gonna stop this. I don't mind dying. That would be a fantastic <laughs> way to die there. Thank you so much. Let me move on and just tell you what we're doing on Wednesday. We're going to be talking about child abductions, perhaps the most feared are abductions by strangers, but in international cases, they're often carried out by a family member. So we'll be looking at the rise in international child abductions and how to solve these cross-border family disputes. But for now, we will be online at stream.aldazero.com if I, if I live to tell the tale, <laughs> if Isa doesn't get me first. Thank you so much for watching. Take care.